Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Renewables. Thank you so much to our listeners and viewers who continue to tune in week after week. Our following continues to grow, and we're so appreciative of everybody who has clicked that follow button on Spotify, Anchor, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Very excited to bring you another Breakthrough Energy Fellow this week, CEO of Mars Materials, Aaron Fitzgerald. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Really nice to connect with you, David, and your audience. Thank you. We we are really appreciative. And the timing is great because we've had some episodes of late about carbon capture. We're going to be talking carbon sequestration today and this amazing company that you've, you've started, uh, Mars Materials. But before we dive in, always open up with, tell us about yourself and your background and how you came to be the CEO of Mars Materials. Yeah, so... Uh, again, thanks for having me. And such, it is such a lovely week. It's uh, SF Climate Week this week. So it's uh, the first time that we're doing it on the West Coast. And it's been a, a great experience. Uh, so I'm Aaron Fitzgerald, CEO and co-founder of Mars Materials. Uh, I'm also a Breakthrough Energy uh, Innovator Fellow. And at Mars, we're working to store captured CO2 into long-lived everyday products. Our goal is to effectively turn products that we all know and use into permanent carbon sinks. And I personally got involved in this um, in climate, particularly after witnessing the devastating aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, uh, and really how it impacted people who look like me and have similar backgrounds. Uh, so for a long time, I just kind of chose to take my own personal small steps to be a better steward towards the environment. And then about a, fast forward about a decade later or so, I took a life-changing trip to Lake Tahoe. It's there I read an article that really highlighted how, um, as a climate-concerned person, I could do more. Uh, and pretty shortly after, I really just sought out opportunities uh, that could help me scale my impact. So that eventually led me to founding Mars, which is solely focused on industrial decarbonization and greenhouse gas utilization. Excellent. So you mentioned Hurricane Katrina. Are you from the Southeast or Louisiana? Where are you from originally? Uh, no, I'm actually originally from Western Pennsylvania. Um, oh, okay. North... Um, uh, northwest of Pittsburgh, um, but I went to college in Memphis, Tennessee, Rhodes College, uh, and okay. an alternative spring break trip uh, to do a road, uh, a rebuilt trip uh, for Hurricane Katrina. Cool. Yeah, I'm sure that was incredible to see. Um, and we have a lot of projects in Pennsylvania, so a lot of love for Pennsylvania. Uh, working on a few things out there. So, okay, you mentioned a little bit about Mars, but kind of give us the elevator pitch. Start at a high level for our listeners and viewers. Tell us a little bit more about Mars Materials and what it is that you do. Yeah, so at Mars, uh, we see ourselves as sitting at the nexus of carbon removal and industrial decarbonization. And what I mean by that is that we look for we're a public benefit corporation and we look to turn uh, the industrial supply chain into carbon sinks where applicable. Um, so we're doing that today by making a monomer called acrylonitrile. You can say that 10 times fast. And um, acrylonitrile is used in everyday, long-lived, durable products like keyboard keys, vacuum parts, carpets, uh, clothing. And, and really important to us uh, is as a uh, feedstock for wastewater treatment chemicals and carbon fiber. Um, it's estimated that every person on the planet consumes about a kilogram of acrylonitrile per year. And it gives it a market value of about $12 billion and it's growing. Um, and we're specifically interested in acrylonitrile because uh, we see it as a key uh, tool in our ability to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Um, acrylonitrile is this compound um, that uh, we say, uh, like that really helps us to, where we can convert acrylonitrile, excuse me, to help treat wastewater. and also use it as an input for polyacrylonitrile based carbon fiber which is the carbon fiber that we mostly all know and use. Uh, it's about 90% of the market. And specifically uh, in carbon fiber, we see our technology as one that can enable um, that material's adoption um, as a strategic decarbonization tool. Uh, so, and what I mean by that is that it can replace hard to decarbonize steel 
uh, in applications like vehicles to lightweight them uh, for transmission lines and in building parts. Fascinating. And I'm I'm really happy that you said acrylonitrile before I did in this episode <laughs> because I would have mispronounced it. So just so everyone knows. Um, and, and that's so fascinating. It sounds like there's a lot of different applications for it. I read on your website that this technology was originally developed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So talk a little bit about that and kind of when did that happen and how did Mars ultimately get involved? Yes, uh, so we're so excited to be an official commercial licensing partner uh, with NREL for the nitrilation technology that underpins our ability to synthesize acrylonitrile uh, with captured CO2 and biomass. Um, so we began collaborating with NREL in 2020. Uh, we were invited uh, to work with them through a pilot program called LabStart, which has since been um, scaled uh, up and is uh, recruiting its next cohort. Uh, so the goal of the LabStart program was to introduce um, entrepreneurs to the national lab system with the goal of getting climate impactful technologies commercialized. Um, I think that uh, we all know and love our national lab system and they have a really great infrastructure for working with large uh, multinational conglomerates, but working with startups can be a bit more tricky uh, given the fact that startups don't necessarily have that reach. Uh, so the LabStart program meant to, was really designed to bridge that gap, but also make it so that uh, the hundreds of technologies that, um, and perhaps thousands of technologies that the National Lab System has developed uh, can, aren't just shelved uh, when, you know, the Few multinational corporations don't want to take them, uh, but leveraging the innovation economy to um, to commercialize them. Uh, so during the program, my co-founder and I, uh, my co-founder's name is Christian Gutch, he and I uh, developed a market-focused uh, technology development framework uh, that was uh, meant to assess various climate impactful at the gigaton scale level um, uh, process technologies. In total, we looked at 18 different technologies across the various national labs, including NREL. And we ultimately down-selected NREL's nitrilation technology for the production of acrylonitrile. There was just so much that we liked about the technology, in, including our ability to um, meet the criterion of carbon utilization and its downstream uh, industrial decarbonization benefits. Fascinating. So acrylonitrile sounds like something you would find on Mars. Is is that is that where the name of your company came from, or was the company founded before you selected this technology to work on? Um, that's <laughs> that's really funny. It's you know it's kind of uh, a fitting. You're right. Like it's a fitting molecule for us to to work <laughs> with. But um, the name Mars uh, actually was uh, predated our choosing of acrylonitrile. There's okay. a short bit about acrylonitrile. It's, um, you know, it is a, it's a monomer, uh, it makes plastics, uh, but it's also naturally occurring on Saturn's moon Titan. So mm. on Titan, it mm. rains acrylonitrile. Um, and NASA has identified acrylonitrile as being one of the molecules that could actually create membranes uh, for organic based life, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, wow. That wow. <laughs> nerdiness aside, uh, the name Mars itself, is, uh, is really less focused on our product and more on why we exist as a company. Uh, so the Martian atmosphere, as you may know, is about 95% uh, CO2. Uh, so it's just an in-situ reference. Um, I, I like the idea that it makes us sound planetary, uh, and that's because that's the impact that, impact that we want to have. Very cool. Very cool. So thank you for coming up with a serious answer to my not so serious question, uh, but that I just thought that was kind of fun. So, tell me a little bit about a little bit more about kind of the development and the use case for this material. I mean, you've mentioned everything from carpets to the automotive industry. Where does this? I guess thinking about it in terms of today and maybe into the future, like where does this material make the biggest impact? Yeah. So. You know, I think when you're thinking about trying to exist in a, a current like value chain um, as a startup, you know, there's so many ways that you can kind of uh, skin the cat on where impact happens. And, and we look at it in a few ways. Uh, so we, um, first, it's our direct utilization of CO2. 
Um, so I think that's really important because um, as the carbon dioxide removal supply chain is starting to mature, um, and you know we're still in its infancy, infancy, but other companies are coming online, and new pathways for atmospheric um, for director capture are coming online, and uh, even point source capture. Uh, we need a place to store that, um, and we absolutely need to leverage geological storage, but I also think there's a place for utilizing that CO2. And it's so core to us that our tagline is reversing industrial waste carbon emissions. And what that means for us is we, we firmly believe at our company that you know it is our industrialization that has caused this, and we think the supply chain should help pay for, uh, pay for it. Uh, so utilizing CO2 is really big for us, uh, but that's a, such a smaller volume to where our, our other impacts are. Um, we also have uh, our process technology itself can synthesize acrylonitrile at an industrial scale with fewer process emissions. Um, it was built on with green chemistry principles. Uh, so what that means for us is that we don't produce um, uh, toxic byproducts. Uh, we are able to have um, easier permitting for our plants uh, because we're not having to inject you know, toxic waste into um, uh, underground wells um, and uh, all the wastewater that we do produce can be purified in a traditional um, kind of um, industrial wastewater processing facility. And then finally for us is the co-benefits on the products that we create. Um, so we see several co-benefits with um, the downstream markets that we're serving uh, with acrylonitrile. Uh, so, and that's also just by far um, our biggest impact where it's uh, most outsized. Uh, so first, I think people don't always think about where or how their products are made, right? And let alone think about where their drinking water comes from, for example. Um, so people are always very surprised when I tell them that uh, the water that we drink is purified using fossil fuels. It's a process called polymer injection. And you take um, this polymer derived from uh, acrylamide, which is derived from acrylonitrile, which again is derived from crude oil. And that's how we get our purified drinking water. Um, and with our process, we can prevent that. We can actually now purify our water with captured CO2 and biomass. Um, on the emissions reduction side of things, uh, we see our technology as enabling carbon fibers use in new emerging markets like vehicles. And um, by lightweighting vehicles, you can reduce fuel demand for internal combustion engine vehicles. And on the uh, battery electric vehicle side, you can either reduce uh, the size of the battery because you no longer have such a heavy car, or you can increase the size of the battery and extending uh, range there. Interesting. So talk a little bit more, um, I suspect you might say vehicles, but talk a little bit more about kind of the everyday products that our listeners and viewers, you know, know and can see and feel and touch um, <clears throat> that contain this material or that, that you are able to produce? Yeah, it's so funny, uh, David, because when I think about, like, you know, I'm, I'm not a chemical engineer and you know, we stumbled upon acrylonitrile and now I look around and I'm like, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's really kind of funny uh, to uh, be in a, a place like that now. But I think one of the, uh, one of the more popular kind of components, uh, 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 components that acrylonitrile is based in is in Lego blocks, actually. So um, ah. Legos are made of something called acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, and acrylonitrile makes up about a third of that, um, oh. of that <laughs> material. Uh, it's also used, as I mentioned, in your vacuum parts, um, components for your car, I mean, excuse me, for your, um, for your uh, keyboard keys, um, some car components, uh, depending on what components they are, um, your carpets. Um, it's, it's really just, it, it's kind of everywhere. Um, and then hmm. where we really care about are the industrial uses though. Uh, so using acrylonitrile to make acrylamide for um, wastewater purification using acrylonitrile uh, to make polyacrylonitrile or pan-based uh, carbon fiber for um, generally carbon fiber and uh, you know just transitioning that supply chain, but also for those emerging markets that we mentioned, like like leading vehicles. We also envision being able to enable new use cases for carbon fiber, 
that aren't necessarily um, that are kind of hamstrung by some of the volume uh, limits that we have with acrylonitrile today and um, some of the just kind of high cost of carbon fiber, which we can help to stabilize with a more uh, cost stable acrylonitrile. And those use cases for us are things that you might see every day, but you don't always think about like transmission lines, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so you can replace uh, the steel reinforced conductors and transmission lines with carbon fiber. And this has been tested in places like Texas and some places in California. And by doing that, you're able to um, uh, reduce line loss and increase line capacity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because as you're thinking about um, you know, transitioning um, and electrifying everything, including our cars, right? We're gonna need more energy. Um, and one of the key bottlenecks we have today our transmission, is our transmission infrastructure to actually deliver that, that uh, downstream need. Um, other, thing, other areas, uh, applications for carbon fiber that we're really excited about with that our technology can help enable is carbon fiber and um, building materials. Um, and we're still early in our discovery on exactly uh, how this might change the skyscrapers of the future, but we've been in talks with several um, architecture firms who are also pretty bullish about this idea. Um, but one of our key focus areas is leveraging carbon fiber as a uh, concrete amendment. So replacing mm -hmm. uh, kind of components like steel uh, with carbon fiber rebar, for example, uh, you can help eliminate um, what is a common issue with kind of steel-based concrete amendments, uh, which is uh, the fact that steel can be a little corrosive. And um, as you may know, um, you know, concrete is one of the most used materials on the planet. It's also heavily emissions intensive on a one-to-one -one ratio of, you know, uh, tons to tons for uh, CO2 to concrete. Uh, and we see opportunities there to, as concrete's becoming a viable carbon sink, um, to help also increase the longevity of that material to permanently store um, um, CO2 in concrete, along with leveraging a material like carbon fiber that can be derived now through our process to capture CO2. Um, and then other areas that we're still exploring are leveraging carbon fiber for hydrogen storage tanks, for example, um, and, um, and other vessels. Wow. So a lot to unpack there. First, uh, the Legos hit home because I have a two-year-old daughter and hopefully it's easy, it's um, safe to not eat, but have that material in your mouth because she's always shoving the Legos into my seven months old old's mouth. So we're working on that. Um, but no, that that's super interesting. And um, being in the solar business, you know, what you mentioned about the transmission side of kind of the electrification of our world, um, you know, really hits home as well. We're seeing in some parts of the country right now where we have a great solar project, we want to interconnect it to the utility. And they're saying it's a four year wait list for an interconnection application, some places even longer than that. And then you see that a lot of, uh, I just read an article the other day that something like 40% of the approved interconnection applications actually never got built. And so, um, you know, being focused in the energy space, that really um, strikes me. And, and I definitely feel that because uh, it's one of the huge, huge, you know, issues that I see coming down the road, particularly as um, like it or not, you know, this country in particular, we seem to be pushing electrification, electrification. And as you mentioned, um, we're going to need a lot more energy. I've seen some folks who have said we might even need double the amount of electricity that we currently produce and consume in this country if passenger vehicles, uh, as you mentioned, were to get to 50% adoption, which is just staggering to me. Um, and so it would be one thing if we had learned how to use less energy um, you know, as a society, but we really haven't. We keep using more and more and and we're going to need even more. So just fascinating all of the different applications. And now, of course, I'm looking around my office here and, um, you know, imagining uh, these this element and everything. So really cool. I thank you for taking the time to kind of walk me through that. And I'm sure we could probably spend another uh, 30 minutes or 30 hours talking about all the different potential applications for this in the future. 
I also happen to be tearing out a uh, brick and concrete set of steps in my backyard every night when I get home right now. So I'm um, all too familiar right now with some of the um, downsides and in carbon intensity of concrete. Uh, so that was a bad joke. Um, so you, you talk about, you know, you're, you're commercializing this, right? Um, I guess educate our listeners and viewers, like, where are you in that process of commercializing this? Is this five years away? Is it 50 years away? Talk a little bit about kind of where you are in the process and, and what the future holds. Yeah, I, um, we definitely can't be 50 years away because we don't have uh, a lot of time uh, to do what we need to do to scale up all these climate impactful technologies. Uh, and frankly, that's why I'm so excited to be part of the Breakthrough Energy Fellows Program to help us you know, uh, accelerate what we are trying to do to get to market. Uh, on the commercialization uh, front, um, it's, re it's really funny because I, I think first it's also important to kind of define what commercialization means because that's it can be a little nebulous and and for us that's you know being able to scale up a technology get it to market um you know find our first revenue but then also continue to optimize so that we can achieve our full vision um and while you know so while building a, a sustainable business um and it's a, an exciting opportunity and um i think we're creating a innovation framework that works for us um and the way that we've structured that today is that uh, we're currently working on our pilot program. Uh, so this is the second of what is four phases in a stage-gated uh, commercialization and technology development roadmap. Uh, so in our first phase, uh, which we completed a couple months ago um, and ran mostly through 2022, uh, we leased NREL lab space. Um, and equipment to produce our initial um, samples of acrylonitrile. So we were able to get uh, produce samples at customer grade, uh, and we were able to deliver those to the three global acrylamide manufacturers. And it's so exciting to share with your audience and with you uh, that we recently received our results back and our material was successfully converted into commercial grade acrylamide. Just a small volume of it, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great proof point and opens up the door for uh, bunch of other next steps for us. Um, and uh, what that means for us as we're in this next phase, this phase two, our pilot program, uh, that is funded by the Breakthrough uh, uh, Fellows Program, is that we are now developing our, our pilot unit uh, where we are uh, operating under a uh, the high throughput parallel testing model. Uh, so what this will allow us to do is to run uh, several experiments at once uh, so that we can aggressively meet our, our scale up uh, requirements and demands so that we can get to market. Um, but uh, in between all that, that means that we have to build a supply chain. Uh, it means that we have to build a team, uh, you know, uh, get resources in the door uh, where we might be lacking. And uh, the whole goal of that is to, you know, at the end, commercialize the technology. So also moving forward with the customer validation work that we're doing. Uh, so we hope at the end of this um, uh, pilot program in phase two, what we'll have is a fully validated acrylonitrile um, uh, monomer in our beachhead uh, market with the acrylamide manufacturers. Uh, and we will have begun the initial validation uh, phase with our carbon fiber uh, partners. Um, the reason why we're able to announce, uh, so we weren't able to start with carbon fiber because those markets require just huge volumes of material. Um, so um, we are very fortunate to be able to scale up in one space while then moving into the other. Following that work, our pilot program work, uh, which mostly is a data collection effort, running experiments to collect data, we use all that data and synthesize it like we've done with our phase one results to de develop our pilot program uh, to de develop our demo plant. Uh, so our demo plant will be a smaller scale version of our full scale plant. And it'd be a first opportunity for us to test each of our unit ops in uh, kind of an integrated fashion with full continuous operation. Um, and then we will, with that demo plant, also have enough volumes of our material to get fully validated in carbon fiber. And then following that, uh, we'll use our data and our learnings and and all the infrastructure that we will have to build for this business to develop our first of a kind full scale commercial plant. 
That is awesome. And we've talked a little bit about breakthrough energy and you alluded to funding, which is obviously crucial to an operation like yours, but congratulations on being a, a breakthrough energy fellow. Talk a little bit about breakthrough energy and, and what it's meant to your business. Uh, the program has been transformative for us um, to you know really reach our net zero goals by 2050, we need huge investments in technologies and we need patient capital and experienced operators to help scale up our processes and while we're also working to bring those cost curves down. Uh, so the breakthrough program really addresses both of those critical gaps. Um, and uh, within that, we also are um, you know, joined with, you know, um, several dozen other teams and uh, in our cohort specifically folks are focused on carbon capture utilization and sequestration, uh, alternative you know, processes for cement, um, electrofuels and, and, and some other categories, including like water um, uh, uh, desalination, I believe. Um, and we're working with Breakthrough and, and their team and their business fellows and our cohort to help immediately unblock us on many of our immediate goals, um, and particularly in the areas of commercialization uh, and some of the uh, you know, kind of um, uh, challenges that I kind of discussed earlier um, in technology development. Um, and then for us um, as a chemical process company, um, that critical community engagement piece, uh, which I often think has been lacking in traditional industry, but really figuring out how to um, systematically and, and with a lens on environmental justice, like site plant locations and, and really, you know, ensure that there's community buy-in uh, for the work that you're trying to do. It's interesting you mentioned plant locations. I was going to ask you, um, I know you're not quite there yet, but where, where is your company located and where, where will your um, smaller scale plant be or do you know yet? Yeah, so we're currently based in uh, the Bay Area, Oakland, California, specifically. Um, we haven't, uh, we don't have line of sight on where we'll have our demo plant um, after the pilot program is um, is, is 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 done. Uh, although it'll never be done, right? We'll always work on optimizations and continue to um, invest in R and D uh, for the company. Um, and we have uh, still working to figure out where we'll place our full scale site as well. Um, so I think this the the early work that we're doing at Breakthrough to uh, come up with a streamlined approach for us for for plant siting uh, is really important, and we're really starting that with our pilot program, um, and um, and and with that we're um, currently working to place our lab here in the Bay Area. Awesome. Okay, I always ask the Breakthrough Energy Fellows just because it's fun. Have you met Bill Gates? I guess you haven't seen the picture, but I'm like kind of not too far away. <laughs> okay. uh, it was really Make cool. sure to include the photo, the photo. Uh, in yeah. the show. In the show. <laughs> awesome. awesome. It's like my mom like broadcasts it everywhere. She's like, do you see my son? You met Bill Gates. <laughs> I'm sure that's a big deal. And, and, you know, this Breakthrough Energy Program, I just can't say enough about uh, that organization. They've brought some amazing guests on our show, obviously, including yourself, but for our listeners and viewers who might not be familiar with it, get online and Google Breakthrough Energy and look at some of their past and current fellows. Because as you read through, I mean, it almost sounds made up. It's like it seems like the future of our world is is all right there on their website. And, and there's just some amazing people with amazing missions just like yourself. So seriously, congratulations on, on being selected as a Breakthrough Energy Fellow. It really is a big deal. And what you're doing is really a big deal. Uh, for the future of our of our world, so um, it's it's been such a pleasure to meet you. There's always a few questions I kind of like to ask at the end. They can be quick answers or they can be long answers. Either way is okay. Um, but what are you most excited about as you look to the future? And then I'll ask you, what is your biggest roadblock to success? So, but first, what are you most excited about as you look to the future and, and you look to the next three, four, five, ten 10 years uh, for Mars materials? Yeah, so, you know, I 
am just thrilled to be expanding our team um, and, and building a team that um, looks like me and like the rest of the world. You know, and I say that Mars welcomes all, doesn't matter your background. Uh, you know, uh, so we, we have a pretty rigorous interview process where we're just looking for goals, skills fit, and it's all behavioral based uh, questions. And um, because at the end of the day, this work is so hard uh, and it's about the stakeholders that we're able to bring online um, and the operators that we're able to you know, bring into the company to help us do this really impactful and incredible work. Uh, so uh, frankly, that's like that gives me joy every day uh, because at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're trying to you know, displace an industry that has been around for you know, 100 years plus. <laughs> and that's hard, uh, but yeah. it's the that matters. Uh, and if you are interested in that uh, and working with us, if anything that I said resonated, uh, I would definitely recommend folks check out our, our jobs that are available. Uh, you can find that on LinkedIn or on our website at marsmaterials.tech. Well, I did actually look and they all have the word engineer in them. So I will, uh, I quickly moved on. <laughs> okay. And what is your biggest roadblock to success? Do you, do you, what, what's your biggest challenge in being successful in your mission? Yeah. You know, I think, um, if I had to answer the other, like if, if you gave me like three things that I'm excited about, the other two would be policy changes and the funding environment that's changing. Those are also yep. two of the biggest yep. roadblocks. Um, on the policy side, you know, I think that our, our, our governments around the world really need to help to um, unlock some of these technologies that are kind of caught up in some of their systems. So improving technology transfer and improving some of the incentives for investors to want to put more money into climate tech. And on that sure, end, sure. Uh, the funding environment, uh, we uh, need more capital at the early stages to help fund these ideas. We need more programs like Breakthrough. Um, energy fellows, you know, helping to cover the technology risk. And then as we start to scale up and launch our plants, we need more kind of catalytic capital moving into project finance. Yeah, makes sense. Well, Aaron, I cannot thank you enough. This has been such an awesome episode and I cannot wait to see the final cut because I know we're going to, our editing team does a great job of bringing in photos and all sorts of different dynamic assets to make these episodes fun. Not that it wasn't fun just having this conversation with you, but for me, I'm such a visual learner. It, it's so helpful to to see things. And um, I really, really look forward to tracking your success. Congratulations on your success thus far. I know there's a lot more to come in the future. A uh, big shout out to Breakthrough Energy for helping set this up and bringing you on the show. Um, lastly, how can our listeners and viewers find you online? We will include your answer in the show notes so it's easy uh, to reach out or connect or stay tuned with what you're up to. Yeah. First, thank you so much for having me, David, and uh, your audience for listening. And, um, you know, we are so excited about what we're doing. And we think that what we are doing is literally helping everyone play a part in carbon dioxide removal. Uh, if you're buying Lego blocks, you're uh, eventually with our material, you're helping to contribute to that. Uh, and if you're more, if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, check out our website at marsmaterials.tech. Um, and you can also follow us online at Twitter. And I believe that handle is at Mars Materials and LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you again, Aaron. Pleasure to meet you. And I look forward to following along with your journey. I'm David Smart. Chief Commercial Officer at Biostar Renewables. Thank you so much to all of our listeners and viewers for continuing to tune in and hitting that follow button. We couldn't do this without you. We're so appreciative. And stay tuned for a lot of amazing episodes coming up in Season 3. Again, this is another episode of Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. 